You, you, my guardian angel, take my soul of fire. <laughs> You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer. Esoteric Hollywood is where I deconstruct the deeper messages, symbols, and predictive programming subtext that underlie modern film. In this show, we will be interviewing artists, experts, and numerous people in media fields. And this will all be based on my years of research in comparative religion, propaganda, psychological warfare, secret societies, and espionage. Esoteric Hollywood decodes the biggest movies in an unparalleled way, from the classics of the silver screen to today's blockbusters. Learn to watch film with completely new eyes as we enter Esoteric Hollywood. Welcome to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, as always, Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. Tonight, we're going to talk Richard Kelly films. We've got two classics from Mr. Kelly, Donnie Darko and The Box. We're going to start with Donnie Darko. And it's always confusing to me doing a nighttime show early in the morning. So I, I'm awake but this will be broadcast at like one in the morning so i feel like i'm in another dimension i was also at the secret space program conference in bastrop texas and that was quite an acid trip let me tell you i got there last week thursday and bastrop texas which is quite a dump, by the way, <laughs> received massive flooding. So the city was literally flooded. Austin was flooded and shut down. And as you're driving, I could actually see trailer parks floating away, literally. You literally hold trailers floating away. And I thought it was quite amusing, although the 50 and above age crowd did not find my joke very amusing. <laughs> We were, I was uh, actually co-opted into being the MC of the event, and it had been a while since I'd done public speaking, so I was not exactly prepared for this, but I went into improv mode, and I thought, well, I'm going to tell some jokes, and so right after Dr. Joseph Farrell had given his lecture where he mentioned Genesis 6 and the fallen angels and the sons of God marrying uh, sons of women, so forth. You mentioned Noah's Ark, right? Because that's the same biblical time period. So I thought when I got up there, it would be funny. I said, uh, yes, I have a new theory on Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was actually Noah's trailer park. And because I saw actual trailers floating away down the river in a flood so I guess that was too soon bad timing for that joke <laughs> I got a few dirty looks for that one uh, I guess it was a bit insensitive but I still think it was kind of funny anyway that's why I'm a bit out of it so uh, I w have been flying and traveling and delayed in airports and I was an airport zombie for a whole day walking around aimlessly So we're going to talk Donnie Darko, cult film, I guess. Now, I, I didn't realize that this film didn't really make that much money. I mean, I knew it was a independent sort of thing and kind of what, I guess, got Richard Kelly going as a director. <clears throat> but, yeah, this this film was a $4 million budget and made 8 so not a big money maker. And I think part of that if you remember back to that time, was the marketing. The marketing for this film was very strange. It portrayed it as this Halloween-style 
Freddy, Jason, uh, you know, Thrasher horror movie. That's not at all what it is. Not one bit. So, bad, weird marketing. The trailer is still that way, by the way. If you go watch the trailer, you'll notice how <clears throat> the trailer completely does not fit this film. But it is, on its most basic level, you know, homage to 80s culture. It's now a cult classic, like many 80s films are, so I guess it achieved its end. It references a whole lot of 80s films, <clears throat> uses popular 80s film themes, like the big party, you know, Teen Wolf-style party, the beer kegger type thing. Uh, but... And, of course, it is set in 1988, but that's not all Donnie Darko is about, right? And if you've not seen Donnie Darko, that you should check it out, definitely. It's not, uh, you hear the name and you think, what, what the heck is that about, right? It's, it's not about, uh, it's not about a nerdy black guy. <laughs> it's actually, I don't know how to describe it. It's not a horror movie. Supernatural, psychological thriller, maybe but done in a very different way, very unique. And it's going to make statements about the socio-political cultural developments of the late 80s, the reversal of family roles, which is that's kind of where the social engineering was really kicking in. It's also a kind of a superhero film, and more properly an anti-superhero, the anti-hero narrative. It's a film that presents the age-old debate about predestination and free will. It's all the kind of stuff that you would think a 17-year-old, which I guess Donnie's about 17 or 18, in the movie. <clears throat> it's all the stuff that you think he would be into. It's kind of jammed into the plot. Predestination and free will. Alternate dimensions and worlds. But that doesn't encapsulate everything either. It also is filled with Jungian psychoanalysis, Gnosticism, and esotericism. So that's what we're going to look at. <clears throat> Deus ex machina, <clears throat> the God from within the system. Now, if we recall when Donnie wakes up in the opening scene of this film, He's lying in the middle of the street, and we hear the killing moon uh, being played by Echo and the Bunny Men. Fade up against your will, he will wait until you give yourself to him. <clears throat> this is the classical hero uh, notion of having to face up to and survive destiny or fate with a stoic resolve right so this is the impression that we're getting from donnie right away why is he waking up in the middle of the street next to his bike <clears throat> at uh you know five or six in the morning and then having to bike home we don't know what but we will find out because donnie is donnie's experiencing supernatural phenomena here right? he's experiencing <clears throat> time displacement visions sort of premonitions of the future, dreams, and so forth. We see at the dinner scene when he arrives home, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also, I should point out too, when he's riding his bike back to Middlesex, which is his little suburban community there, he passes the car that is his brother's boyfriend. And this is a really brief hint, foreshadowing of what's, what's to come. Now, and if you haven't seen this movie, uh, it's going to be a little bit difficult, but this is, it's the coming of age high school story that we're so familiar with from the 80s. Breakfast Club, as I said, Teen Wolf, you know, that kind of stuff. Pretty in Pink, 16 Candles. And this, though, is very dark, hence Darko. It takes a different, different twist on all that. And it's going to, so it's an 80s party coming of age film, but told kind of in a negative reverse fashion. So as Donnie is, uh, as he heads home and he, we see that he's part of Middlesex, this which is a strange name. <clears throat> is it androgyny? Is it, what does it mean? Because there is a, the beginning of a transition of roles here. 
right? And so when this is exemplified at the, the dinner scene, which is this dysfunctional dinner, the father's not a father, and he remains passive throughout this preposterous argument <laughs> that they have over dinner. The pill-popping, wine-swilling, bitchy mother runs the family, and the children are you know, just exceptionally rebellious, profane. And this relates to the film's criticism of, I think, 80s culture, especially its backwards, hypocritical, suburban morality. And it's curious, too, that we see M.C. Escher, the famous artist, his drawing of the eye is prominently displayed in Donnie's bedroom. And in the reflection of that eye is the pupil, or the pupil has the reflection of death. And death is going to be the major theme in this movie. It's not just the generic notion of death, but death, particularly in the Jungian or Gnostic perspective, where death has to actually be sort of incorporated into the psyche. It has to be accepted. It has to be uh, welcomed in that view. And that's what ultimately is going to happen with Donnie Darko. <clears throat> now, if you don't know who Carl Jung is, he was the Swiss psychoanalyst disagreed with Freud and he pioneered the discipline of psychoanalysis. And so when we consider that when Donnie wakens from his dream state, his trance state, at 8.23, what's visible is also the Led Zeppelin album poster for Swan Song. And this actually does feature an image of sort of Lucifer falling from the heavens on the album cover. And this is in Donnie's bedroom. <clears throat> It's also next to an upside down flag, which of course signifies nation in distress. Now I'm being you know, just a little bit speculative, but you know, perhaps these two images are linked. I don't know, perhaps not. But either way, the Lucifer eye image is prominent in this film, as we'll see. And this considers, I'm not, I mean, I understand that eyes are put everywhere in films and I'm not like vigilant citizen here pointing out that every eye has some tremendous significance. It doesn't, but sometimes it does. Sometimes it is very significant and it is, you know, Masonic and all the way back to Egypt, the Wajat, right? An Egyptian symbol. And in this movie it is significant. So we're going to continue with Donnie Darko, just dissecting it. We've just began, but you're listening to esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis, and you're listening only on talknetwork.com, the best place for alternative talk radio without corporate control. When we come back, we'll talk about the next couple scenes in Donnie Darko that are quite revelatory, and I don't know what to make of some of these scenes. Maybe you can help me. Welcome back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer. We're discussing Donnie Darko. Donnie, Donnie Darko. Who's Donnie Darko? The 2001 American science fiction, I guess we could say, psych thriller drama. And we were talking about the imagery that we see in Donnie's bedroom. And I think it's telling. It's symbolic. It's preparing us for America in distress and the anti-hero. It's also going to be about death because as I'm going to spoil it for you, hold your ears for 20 seconds if you've not seen this and you plan to. It's Donnie's bedroom through which the fuselage will collapse and destroy Donnie himself. So is Donnie caught in an after-death time loop, perhaps? We'll see. Now, it's the, it, the f man flying, right, in 747s, and then the, the, the idea of this Promethean rebellion against you know, being limited by time and space, and then man purportedly at least going into space and so forth. This is oftentimes pictured in a Promethean sense from mythology. Prometheus rebelled and took the fire of the gods, right? 
Now, it's the engine that's going to fall through Donnie's roof. And it's going to be right where this image of the fall of, of Lucifer is placed within Donnie's bedroom. Now, that, as I said, the all-seeing eye is sometimes associated with Lucifer or Satan, but it generally depends on the context or the intent from which we can derive, and we can't just we can't read into these things, is what I'm trying to say. So you have to actually look at the whole film and the context of where the imagery is used before you can just start saying, "Oh, that's an all-seeing eye. That means Satan or something silly like that." So it also, for example, has referred to the omniscience of God at times in church history. So it's not a one-dimensional symbol. It's a symbol that's had multiple uses for millennia. You know, Solomon, for example, speaks of God's all-seeing eye in terms of divine providence in Proverbs, right? So... Now, I don't believe that Solomon was secretly speaking of Satan there. I think he's talking about God. And the Egyptians, of course, applied it to Horus as a symbol of the divine attribute of omniscience as well. So the point here being is that it means different things. And sometimes in Masonic settings, it might mean something else. Sometimes in a setting of intelligence, it might mean spying. And... Uh, yeah, you, you just can't try to nail it down into, into one thing. Now, as with most films, details are crucial. And I, are crucial, and I think directors and producers will, you know, they'll, they'll place things there for a reason. And so we acute attention, I think, should be paid to details. And if you watch the commentaries on this film, as well as others, you'll see this often referred to. A lot of, a lot of times they'll point out details that do apply to understanding the overall narrative of the film. Now, it's significant that Frank, the rabbit, is the dead spirit that possesses Donnie, and he communicates to him at midnight. Midnight is associated, of course, in many spiritual traditions with liturgical actions or ritual actions, presumably in the cult as well. This is kind of the... There's also the notion of the witching hour, which is what, like 3.33 a.m. or something. We read in Stoker's Dracula, something like, it is the eve of St. George's Day. Uh, do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world have full sway? So this is just an old folktale tradition <clears throat> that the spirits of the demons and the dead commune at midnight. And this is actually, you know, when... when Frank speaks to Donnie, especially as the film moves closer to Halloween, which will be very significant. This is when Donnie's world will end. And this is what Frank, is, the spirit, is telling him. On whenever, whenever, the world will end. Now, speculating at this point, right, that's when Donnie's in, in his trance state. And then Donnie writes the date and the, the, the number on his arm. Now, the list of numbers that, that are given, interestingly enough, can actually total 666. Now, in Gematria, which is the Jewish and Greek style of actually turning the numerals into, or turning the, the letters of the alphabet into numerals, right? So they didn't have the Arabic numeral system that we have of the digits of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? They had letters. That's why. Roman numerals function as, as letters and numbers. And it's the same way with the Hebrews and with the Greeks. Alpha is one, beta, two, gamma, delta, epsilon, and so forth. <clears throat> and so 666 in Gematria is the number of a man in St. John's Apocalypse. The number of the beast, we're told. Now, I believe that the number of this the, the number that is a name is Gematria. I believe that it's Nero. I don't believe that it's uh, this future world dictator per se. <clears throat> that may be possible, but I don't think that anyone really knows that. Frank says, 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, and 12 seconds. The world will end. Now, you can get 
a six 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 out of all these numbers, right? They're they're very they're sixy type digits. If we subtract two from eight, we get six. Six hours, forty two minutes, four plus two, and then twelve seconds, which is six plus six. And again, speculative I know, but with the the level of depth of thought that was put into this film, I don't think that it's a stretch, right? Obviously He's dealing with Jungian analysis, psychoanalysis. He's dealing with the subconscious. He's dealing with higher dimensions, time travel, the, these esoteric concepts, right? It's also significant that the engine crashes into the house. And while this happens, uh, Donnie's father is watching the Bush Dukakis debate of 1988. He's, he's totally invested in his neo connery so to speak, right? He's, his dad's just a complete neo con, which is uh, appropriate for this yuppie, up, upper middle class section of America, middle, middle sex, right? And we know that what was actually going on in Nicaragua and elsewhere, this is what's mentioned in the debates in this scene in the film, <clears throat> was the Iran-Contra Iran scandal. And this was, of course, organized by the neoconservative establishment and Reagan to have backdoor deals with Iran to funnel money, money launder, to the Contras, right, for death squads and so forth. And the irony here is that Donnie is drugged up and he's experiencing serious spiritual problems. Meanwhile, the war on drugs that's being mentioned is just getting started. The the, the, you know, the Reagan, Nancy, Bush era war, war on drugs. <clears throat> the establishment is shown to be a complete fraud. And this anti-establishment theme will run through the film because Donnie is not a hero in the traditional sense. He's a dark hero, if he's even a hero at all. I mean, he might even actually be a kind of a satanic hero. I don't know. I guess it's up for debate. <clears throat> Now, the school's mascot is funny because it's a mongrel, <laughs> which carries <clears throat> the connotation of retardation and idiocy. So it's almost as if the middle, upper middle class and upper class neoconservative Republican establishment is just completely idiotic. They don't have no idea what's going on. Totally bought into Bush, Reagan, all of which was a big drug CIA scam. And... It's particularly the teachers and principals, or the teacher and the principal, teachers and the principal who are the most duped members of this private school that, that Donnie attends, right? And because they all fall for this self-help guru, Jim Cunningham, played by Patrick Swayze. And Jim Cunningham, as we'll find out, is not just a big fraud. He's an exceptional kind of wicked fraud but he's written this self-help book called attitudinal beliefs and it was during this period that self-help you know was really taking off i mean we are there had already been norman vincent peale's uh power positive thinking back in i guess the late 70s or so 60s and early early 70s but you know we think about the self-help movement really ramping up in the 80s and the ideas of not disciplining your children dr spock and all this kind of stuff and this uh, transition in in how people operate in the socio-political sphere a lot of that had to do with not just mass media but things like uh, positive thinking and the uh, get rich by thinking get your rich <laughs> scheme don lapree right making Making money is so easy. Don, Le I'm Don Lepree. I want to tell you how by one tiny classified ad, you... All right, welcome back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer. <clears throat> We're talking Donnie Darko. And we've gotten to the point where the Middlesex town is actually run by a corrupt establishment who's completely oblivious to reality. And one of the key figures is Jim Cunningham, this self-help phony who's written a book, Attitudinal Beliefs. And he runs the Cunning Vision production company. If you think of that video, the Cunning Vision production of Controlling Fear, 
uh, one of the best, most comedic scenes in the film. I'm not afraid anymore. This it actually also has a deeper sense because uh, a person of cunning is someone who has sort of psychic or occult powers, traditionally speaking. And Donnie is, of course, the visionary prophet of the film. <clears throat> it's also significant that the woman who uh, was a prisoner of her fear, right, in this video, she looks into the mirror to see the reflection of her own ego. So we have another reference to that Jungian symbology. And this will be crucial when we consider other instances of, of Donnie seeing his ego image in the mirror. And that actually is the character Frank. Now, Frank, we find out, was the guy in the car at the beginning, the very first scene, when Donnie's Viking home. And Frank is also Maggie Gyllenhaal's boyfriend, right? Maggie Gyllenhaal plays Donnie Darko's sister and actually is Jake Gyllenhaal's sister in real life. And Maggie, <clears throat> I had the, Maggie's name escapes me at the moment in, in, the, uh, in the film. But she is older and, and you know, really into her boyfriend and doesn't really care about Donnie, Donnie and what he's up to. So, but Donnie is kind of this rebel teen guy, outsider loner type. And it's Frank who progressively begins to take a larger part in Donnie's life as his ego or his higher self or his alternate persona or the spirit whom is possessing Donnie. And he is a large rabbit, a large creepy looking uh, demonic sort of rabbit, right? And he, <clears throat> this rabbit is inexplicable until the end of the film where <laughs> we find out why he's actually wearing a rabbit suit and that it's actually Frank. Frank is the boyfriend. Now, Donnie doesn't know what he's done or what's why these things are happening to him. It's it's so he's actually seeing a psychiatrist and he's trying to figure reality out. He's kind of having these breaks, these dissociative episodes. And so he's taking pills, but the pills aren't doing anything and they're not helping. And this I think signifies that beginning of when the late eighties and into the nineties where the pills and big pharma really took over, where they really started drugging us on a mass scale and this was all by design for social engineering especially if you've read brave new world so as frank takes a larger role in donnie's life in Jungian analysis i think we can look at it as something that has to be integrated into the waking self as young said now in this gnostic view it is the self that is not whole until it reconciles all the dualities so the archetypes have to be reconciled Carl Jung thought, or they will control us. In Donnie's progress at his psychiatrist's office, he goes deeper and deeper into his subconscious, right? And the therapist finally pulls out Frank, who we learn was, for Donnie, God. But Donnie can't make sense of this rationality, right? And so he argues that God doesn't make sense and that perhaps raw materialism or nihilism or atheism is the case. And that in the end, rather than debating it, why not just accept that we all die alone? So Donnie's tempted with this nihilism because he can't understand the phenomena that are happening to him that are otherworldly. They're, they're occultic. They're, they're connected to his dissociative breaks with reality. Now, it's curious that the materialism and atheism would come into this because it really is kind of a, I, I believe, an early angsty teen type of rebellion. I mean, it's not a really sensible worldview, even though it's the era that we live in. Most people believe in materialism and nihilism and that nothing really matters. We're just a product of random forces of evolution. And if that's the case, you know, we were all dying alone. Nothing matters. Nihilism is the end result. And it's really into the 80s and 90s, especially into the last 15 years, that the social engineering has 
really taken us down that route of the loss of meaning, the loss of tradition, the loss of culture, the loss of social order as we rapidly transition into the brave new world technocracy, into the dystopia. And that's what they want. That's what they're openly, purposefully engineering is this nightmare dystopia. And this middle sex America becomes an image of the dystopia. Now it's taking place in 1988, which is where, as I said, this is, this is the, you know, the cusp of the eighties. We think of the, the yuppie phenomenon, the young urban professionals in the, the Reagan era and neoconservatism and all that. And how that was so largely a fraud, especially if you've read um, people like Lee, uh, Leo Strauss or Sam Huntington, these different neoconservative strategists who thought that the mythology of America needed to be resurrected. And ultimately, they discussed the fact that it's not real. It's all a lie because it's an empire built on drugs and scams and money laundering. And that's actually the truth. Think of the film American Hustle. Very uh, appropriate image as well. Now, it's Frank, as we said, who plays this key role of the, the mystery character, the shade, Donnie's shade in terms of archetypes. And in the end, it's Donnie who's going to have to reconcile with who Frank is. And if this world ends, the therapist tells him, well, it'll only be you, Donnie, and Frank, or your God. Frank, you recall, is Donnie's ego, his mirror image. And is the <clears throat> he's the personification of Donnie's fear of death. Now remember, this is all an alternate reality where Donnie has asserted that he will face, he, he, that he will exert his will in the face of what he fears, which is raw determinism. So that's why the predestination free will debate comes into this because it's if, if nihilism and, and materialism and atheism are true, then there's no free will because there's no consciousness. So you can't have choice and volition and meaning in your life without some notion of will or volition or the notion of a person that you are actually a person and that your consciousness is not uh, illusory, right? It's not the result of uh, meaningless, uh, successive, predetermined causal phenomena that are just purely naturalistic. Now remember this, this also, so this is why Donnie is having a hard time reconciling his dissociation and his occult experience with what's happening in his nihilistic teen angst experience. So what happens is instead of predestination, it's Donnie has opted to fight his dark shade, Frank, who is both a kind of devil figure and a somewhat good deity. So it's, it's shady here. It's the unknown God, if you will, to use the terminology of Acts 17, perhaps the hidden God. For evidence of this, I think we can consider this short explanation um, from Carl Jung, right, where Jung talks about the individuation process and what Jung says is essentially, I'll summarize it, that, that throughout our life we're in this process of becoming an individual, uh, becoming who we are supposed to be, right, what, what Aristotle would call the telos, right, flourishing into our full potentiality. And, or the potentiality becoming actuality. So to use Aristotelian terminology, if you think of an ac acorn, an acorn is not the full final stage of what that object is intended to be. It has a purpose, which is to eventually flower into the full tree. So that would be actu uh, potentiality coming to actuality, the potentiality being the seed, the acorn, the actuality being the tree. And so what Carl Jung said was that we actually need to apply this process to the individual and his journey, the psyche, throughout life. And what has to happen is that it has to continually reconcile 
these oppositional forces that it that it comes in contact with and this is in psychoanalysis the uh, phobias fears the hang-ups neuroses that people have are a result of not dealing with these fears and these traumas we will however find out why this has happened with donnie because it's uh, something that Donnie has caused that he's blamed himself for that he didn't really do. I mean, he wasn't exactly culpable for the action that has caused him to dissociate in, uh, in his mind, set loose this chain of events that for him is the end of the world. <clears throat> but he does, I guess, in some sense, share some culpability because he's, you know, he's not a perfect character. He's an anti-hero. He's a dark hero. So he does have the Achilles heel, the flaw uh, that the hero generally has. So we're going to take a break. But when we come back, you're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. And I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. And we're looking at Donnie Darko. Welcome back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. We've been talking about how Donnie Darko is going through the individuation process in Jungian schemes. And if we think about, well, actually, there, there are interviews. And if you go to jaysanalysis.com, you'll find my article on Donnie Darko. And I have embedded in there. An interview with both Carl Jung and then an interview with Jake Gyllenhaal. And Gyllenhaal explains that the film is really about the individuation process. And there's basically no question that that's what this is about. And it is using the Jungian archetypes. So Donnie is what he comes in contact with. The manifestations in the film are elements of his subconscious that he must reconcile. So it's really a, a film about the psyche. It's not about time travel and all these different theories. Now, that's not to say that the events aren't real, uh, but it, it's kind of similar to Inception, which has a similar plot, uh, which I have an analysis of, of that as well. And I think that we can tease out what the objective meaning is, more or less, when we consider that. Think about Jenna Malone. Okay, so Jenna plays Gretchen Ross, who becomes Donnie's girlfriend. When she arrives, she becomes his immediate love interest, and she functions ultimately to wake Donnie up. That's her role. She, it's not what Donnie wants, but she forces him into this. And this is precisely the function that the anima, or the mother archetype, plays in the role of self-individuation in the Jungian process. Now, it would be tempting, I think, to say that Donnie's mother maybe is the archetype, a mother archetype, but she only plays a minor role. So I suspect that the two archetypes of anima and mother are actually combined in Gretchen because Donnie's parents are somewhat absentee. They don't really play much of a role in Donnie's life. They truck him off to the psychiatrist. They're not really interested. And it's Gretchen who is the catalyst for waking up Donnie. But let's back up a little bit. So when Donnie arrives at school, we have that iconic scene where Tears for Fears plays when he gets out of the school bus. The camera is noticeably sideways. And I think this clues us in to the fact that both the sideways nature of this alternate world, it's not a normal world that Donnie's in. It's a lopsided sideways world. And it's out of kilter. It's out of kilter with nature as, as the school itself is out of kilter. It's a synthetic system. It's a fake overlay the entire social structure is askew and donnie is apparently only one who's beginning to get the guts to point this out and this is why donnie's the anti-hero so the this anarchic i guess you could say uh, element to donnie is found in the scene where he's the only one who understands the meaning of the graham green story the destructors and the story is ab about kids who basically burn down uh, a house because they see it as a form of creation. Donnie says that destruction is a form of creation. And this is the mindset of the darkest of the dark, right? Since this sort of psychopathic mindset, since reality is determined by brute force and raw materiality, 
in an irresistible causal chain that can't be broken, as we said before, then all actions are leveled and ontologically the same. There's no difference between any other. There's no positive, negative, good, bad. There's no qualitative difference between actions. There's no good or evil. They're all just actions of the machine. We're all in this machine, this matrix, if you will. And this is why Donnie says to the bully when he's at the in the brawl, Deus ex machina, God from machine. The world that Donnie struggles to accept appears to be a predetermined machine, including the false social structure of the neoconservative establishment. And since this is the case, burning down old misery's house in the Graham Greene story is qualitatively no different from creation or destruction. They're, they're the same. Creation is destruction. Destruction is creation. And this constitutes the most, I think, satan, satanic or Gnostic element in this film. And we can recall as well that Graham Greene was a British intelligence asset, worked for MI6. So there's a reason why that story is included. And Donnie is drugged by Big Pharma, or so we think. And as a result of this, he continues to have his intense experiences of synchronicity over and over and over in communication with the dead spirit of Frank. Frank's visions are of the future, premonitions, prophecies. In the famous scene where Donnie tells Frank in the movie theater during Evil Dead, uh, right, where they're sitting there and Donnie's in his Ralph Macchio, Karate Kid style outfit. He says, why are you wearing that suit? When Donnie sees Frank there, Frank says, why are you wearing that stupid human suit? This is one of the debates, right? That this is connected to the debate that Donnie has with his physics professor, Dr. Monotov. Donnie was told that bodies are vessels that travel along vectors in space time. So Donnie is inhabited like a vessel by the spirit of dead Frank. But since this is a kind of a Gnostic union perspective, the external world is not real. It's not the objective reality, but rather a projection of the psyche and the subconscious desires that are yet to be fulfilled and integrated. Since Donnie has not reconciled good or evil as notions in him in his psyche as well as dualities where his sexual relations are strange to him good and evil are strange to him he is a actually a prisoner of fear so this is irony because the goofy new age presentation from cunning visions the self-help infomercial actually ends up being correct <laughs> And this is a masterful use of irony and humor here, right? But when I say correct, I'm saying within that paradigm of the Gnostic Union perspective. It's significant also that when Donnie leaves the movie theater, the sign we see is the last temptation of Christ. And this clues us into the fact that Donnie is a kind of anti-hero, a kind of anti-Christ almost, a Gnostic savior. He's a Jesus figure of the last temptation who was in reality just a man who rebelled. Now, if you think back to Christopher Nolan's Inception, and if you look at my analysis there, what we see is all the same Jungian archetypes. And Jung himself spoke this way. Jung said, I am an I'm Gnostic uh, in some form or fashion. He saw himself as an Illuminist. And he explains this if you watch the interview that I have embedded in my in my piece on Donnie Darko so by default you know whether writers know it or not when you're heavily steeped in Carl Jung which is a lot of writers will utilize Carl Jung you're dealing with some kind of quote Illuminism right some notion of the spark of divinity within and then trying to overcome the material world and there is in fact an article that Carl Jung wrote about evil and Antichrist where he argues that these are just flip sides of the same coin good is as necessary as evil well that's pure Gnosticism right and that's partly what we're seeing here with Donnie Darko 
So let's get back to the story. And so Donnie sees a vision where his high school is flooded and Frank leads him to burst the water line in a dream. He says, go, go bust the water line. And this causes school to be kept called off the next day. As a result, he's able to ask Gretchen out and they quote, go together. <laughs> it's a funny scene, right? Because, so are you going with anybody? What do you mean? You want to go together? Okay. Then we see Samantha Darko, Donnie's little sister. She's reading a poem called The Last Unicorn. Curiously, the unicorn's name is Ariel. And is saved by a prince named Justin, who is translated into another world of magic and wonder. Now this is fascinating because it's a curious parallel to what's happening with Donnie. The poem seems a little out of place, but unless we understand that it's this alternate world that is Donnie's alternate world, where he is Justin saving the Ariel, or saving the unicorn Ariel uh, from destruction. And that's what Donnie will do with Gretchen. It's not until Donnie's willing to exit his self-obsessed narcissism by being willing to give his life for Gretchen that Donnie is reconciled to all of this madness that's happened in his life. The fact that he is responsible for Frank's death. Recall also, I think we should mention in scripture, in the Bible, Ariel is another name for Israel. So perhaps in an esoteric sense, we could see this as maybe Kabbalism. So, uh, certain Gnostic texts would actually utilize this wrathful conception of Ariel. Uh, Ariel is, is viewed as something wrathful uh, in the Gnostic texts, a kind of spirit, a, a destructive spirit, something like Lilith per perhaps. And Ariel is what Donnie is having to deal with and reconcile himself to. So if you look up the notion of Ariel, You'll get just Wikipedia for reference here, but Ariel has been portrayed as a destructive spirit of rep, rep, retribution. In the Coptic text, the Pistis Sophia, Ariel is in charge of punishment of the lower worlds co corresponding to the, to the Ur of the Mandaeans. This is possibly due to Ariel's association with the archangel Uriel, who is often equated with Ur. Both Ariel's uh, destructive attributes and dark character have led to associations with the deities Nemesis and Sekhmet, amongst others. However, it's Ariel's position as a spirit of wrath that seems more in keeping with the Judeo-Christian tradition. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood, and we are deconstructing Donnie Darko. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Welcome back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. You're listening on talknetwork.com. And I want to encourage you to go to j.talknetwork.com because you're going to get the best options for living organic there. Over 500 products there. Mike Adams of Natural News has a lab where he personally has that he's personally set up where he can actually test all these things apart from the EPA, apart from government agencies to get his own assessment, right? And those that work with him of how uh, free from contamination the products are. And certainly he's wanting to strive for that. And I don't think you're going to find that in most places. Uh, even a lot of the mainline vitamin uh, the, the vitamins that are out there in the stores, the companies that produce those are actually owned by the big conglomerates, right? So they're not concerned where they can bypass the regulations that the government tries to put out there. So you want to look for people who are doing this independently of the establishment and, you know, people who are doing science on their own. I think that's a great thing. It's what we need more of. And that's what Mike's trying to do there with the talk network national news store so if you're looking for any supplements any kind of products in that vein especially as we get near the holiday season be sure to go to j.talknetwork.com and that'll take you through 
to the store. Now, we were talking about the wrathful conception of Ariel and the Pistis Sophia, this Gnostic text that uh, Ariel is this vengeful spirit. And it's usually depicted as a controller or a punisher of demons or wicked spirits rather than a kind of retributive force. So it's kind of a punitive, restorative chastisement type of thing. And that's what's happening with Donnie. Donnie's being chastised because he needs to be brought into reconciliation with the, the issues that he has in his life, in his psyche, the trauma that he's experienced through killing Frank. Now, when Donnie saves Gretchen, who is a, in a way his Ariel or the incarnation of his Ariel and he they have sex at the party he's reconciled and united with her in an alchemical sense and this is actually what Carl Jung writes about quite a bit he's reconciling with the things that are problematic for him one of which was sexuality and so he lets loose of his sexual repression which he mentioned to his psychiatrist under hypnosis and maybe there's a mind control element here too right so he's going to a psychiatrist and we know that it's the psychiatrist that we're running a lot of the mind control and it's Gretchen that's his Ariel his anima and it's when he unites with her that he begins to see his destiny at midnight once again and it's when he looks into her soul that he sees his destiny and this is the cellar door the subconscious this is what Donnie's starting to realize that the cellar door, which is the quote that Drew Barrymore, as his teacher, gives as one of the best, uh, one of the most beautiful phrases in the English language from Tolkien, she says, cellar door. She quotes Tolkien. Oh. And the cellar door is the subconscious. So when Donnie looks into Gre to Gretchen, that portal shows him cellar door, and that's what he hears. So Donnie has realized that his destiny, which he must face, is to travel to Roberta Sparrow's house, where these continual synchronicities have been leading him all along. And Roberta Sparrow is the crazy old ex-nun who became a radical atheist after writing her book on time travel. So she left the church and she became Grandma Death. So once again, this vengeful female archetype, this Lilith. Grandma Death. And she's also linked, like, I, th I think she's linked to Old Misery in the Graham Greene story, which is what Donnie references early, earlier in the film. So when Donnie arrives, what he discovers is that it's his nemesis, the bully, who's waiting at the cellar door. And he must face the bully, right? This dark power in his subconscious, the Satan, Satan type character. And he must also face up to the fact that it's he who inadvertently kills Frank. So Frank, the boyfriend, who's been haunting him all along and who figures as God in a kind of projection of Donnie's psyche, it's also his shade and his dark side representing Don's, Donnie's own evil. Cellar Door uh, is, again, a reference to Tolkien, right? And of course, with Tolkien, we have the association of the Eye of Sauron, so more eye imagery. Uh, but it was also supposedly said to be important by Al uh, Edgar Allan Poe, too. So this phrase, cellar door. Well, why does this matter? I think it's the same reason that in Inception, if you think about Cobb, the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio, it's when he reaches the deepest level of his subconscious when he's going through the dream states, right? This is where he's hidden away, repressed, the shade, the dark side, the trauma. And this allows for there to be a doorway for a dark spirit, a dark entity to, to get in and to wreak havoc in his life. And this is exactly what's happening with... Donnie, it's the same thing that happened to Cobb with Mal, his wife. For Donnie, it's Roberta Sparrow's house that he has hidden away. Uh, the cellar there. He's hidden the fact that he killed Frank, his sister's boyfriend. And he did it in a fit of rage 
uh, for accidentally running over Gretchen. Right? Donnie's uh, Maggie's Maggie Gyllenhaal's boyfriend Frank, when he arrives at the at this fight, accidentally runs over Gretchen. So Donnie goes into a fit of rage, he's traumatized, and Donnie then shoots Frank in the eye. Right. So the cellar doorway is the doorway to the basement in Jungian analysis. This is the subconscious realm. This is where we find the darkest and most bestial aspects of our persona. So Donnie must face his fears, his evil, that he was by triumph of will. A decision to be against the Deus. He is the Deus Ex Machina, the God from within the machine. He is the Ubermensch. Who has set in motion a course of events that leads to the death of his friends. So the resolution comes when Donnie decides to be a stoic, to accept his fate as Donnie Darko, the kid who was smashed in a freak jet accident. And this is what's mentioned by the kid at the end. Who lives there? Oh, I don't know, some kid. He was smashed in a smashed by a jet engine. So in, the entire alternate world story is the elaborate story that Donnie's psyche created, concocted, because his world came to an end. And just as happened to Cobb in Inception, so has it happened to Donnie. God is, for Donnie, viewed as a fearful, vengeful deity because the subconscious fears death. And hence it is the identification that Donnie makes between Frank and God to the therapist. And this is ultimately why Donnie says deus ex machina to the bully when they're fighting. God is a product of a determined machine, he thinks. Because he feels guilty. Because he feels this oppression. But really, it's Donnie needing to get past these things. To be reconciled to and own up to these things. That will set Donnie free. This is also, I think, why the film poster has a collage of figures that are all in Donnie's psyche. They make up the God slash death mask of Frank, all the characters. And so we end with a rupture in the subconscious of others as a result of Donnie's death, right? So when Donnie dies at the point of the jet engine smashing his bedroom, it's almost like everyone seems to know. It's as if they dreamed this alternate world that Donnie constructed where he was an anti-hero. And they're all noticeably distraught, right, when, when Donnie meets his demise on Halloween night. So Donnie's alternate world is fictional. It's a dream world. It's a reality where he must face up to his fate stoically as well as being reconciled to the havoc that he caused through killing Frank although Frank apparently seems to be alive so it's almost maybe this as if this alternate version of things was this you know the split second lifetime that's playing out before Donnie who knows the also another thing I can't exactly place is the invention that Donnie and Gretchen come up with where they invent goggles for a kid to only see pleasant images. And I think it's definitely showing that there's a need to be uh, healed of childhood trauma. That's definitely a significance of the invention. But what exactly that's supposed to mean within the, the narrative I'm still iffy on. And so I think this world presents two options, right? brute determination of natural forces where nihilism and nothing matters. Uh, and in that kind of a world, it's better to be a Donnie Darko, who's a kind of dark, anarchic, anti-establishment figure who he might want to destroy the system, but maybe destroying the system will bring some good in the process. And that's ultimately what this, the situation with Jim Cunningham was, right? The character that Patrick Swayze plays, who's actually a pedophile and he's discovered to be a complete fraud. And that is actually true, right? So there's a traumatization that's going on with kids. They've been traumatized. There's an underground satanic pedo network, apparently, that 
operates behind all this jibber jabber gobbledygook of self help and respectable conservative establishment. It's all fake. And in that regard, we can see it as a good message ultimately. And so we're back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Every Tuesday to Friday, 10 p.m. Pacific on talknetwork.com. It is Esoteric Hollywood. We've been talking about Richard Kelly's Donnie Darko, the cult classic now from 19... What was Donnie Darko? I've already forgotten the date. 2001, excuse me, 2001. And... We noted how it was kind of a journey of the psyche and Donnie reconciling. And I also think there's a, you know, there is that child um, pedo element to it that is the cause of Jim Cunningham's downfall, right? The character played by Patrick Swayze. So it's almost like there was a network of this going on. Perhaps that's why some of these people were traumatized particularly Donnie. Was Donnie molested? Was he traumatized? It's possible. It's possible. Now, next, I would like to move on to another Richard Kelly film, eight years later, that was not that well received. I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. And it's called The Box. And this is a tribute to Kubrick, it's a tribute to 2001, quite clearly. And the film has the tagline, you are the experiment. So as I often lay out, you know, fictional films, you know, could show us much more about reality than the mainstream news outlets. And the box is one of the most striking examples. And this is, I need to do Southland Tales, which is another Richard Kelly film that also has all these same elements. And Southland Tales is kind of a mix between Donnie Darko and The Box. But The Box is, well, ultimately it's about a secret space program. And so I brought this up in my lecture this last weekend at the secret space program conference in Bastrop. And it's a very Illuminati film, I guess we might say, in a kind of eyes wide shut vein to use the term generically. The box contains hints of homages towards Kubrick. Uh, you know, on the surface, however, the viewer is presented with a moral dilemma, and it's this idea of compromising your morals and suffering consequences as a result that you think you're going to evade. So there's this, this box is presented to this couple, and if you push the button, you will kill someone, but you get a million dollars, and it's this shadow government shows up and, and tells uh, James Mars in this uh, and his wife Norma played by Cameron Diaz so Arthur and Norma are given the opportunity to get out of their financial troubles if they just push this button but they know that it's going to kill somebody so it's a deal with the devil it's a sacrifice now on a moral level I think this is telling us about American culture and the idea of the American empire and it fits into the drone scheme because we think well we are going to live well in America and we're going to get them rag heads we're going to get all them people over there in the Middle East we're going to drone them down we're going to take them out with them drones and we're going to live high on the hog because we're America damn it and that's not really how it is that's a construct. That's a lie. That's the propaganda lie that we defeat our enemies and we live well because we're righteous. That's not actually true. No, I mean, it's obviously a lot more complex than that. It's not, it's just not that black and white. And, you know, the idea of just sitting in a trailer somewhere wearing your Air Force outfit and pushing buttons and playing a video game and droning people is just insane. And, but that's kind of the moral trade-off that we have in, in the U.S., right? Now, the film wasn't a critical success, but I think it's, it's, it's so full of detail and depth that it, it just has to be appreciated, even if you ultimately don't care for it. And it's... Uh, it's 
Norma, who in the poster we see is kind of covered in blood, it's almost like a blood sacrifice. It's Norma who's ultimately going to be sacrificed to Mars, the god of war, Nurgle. The story takes place in 1976 where NASA has this Viking mission and Mars and Arthur plays the camera engineer for the Viking mission. And they've just bought a new home. They're trying to settle in. It's large, upper middle class, suburban family. And they're overwhelmingly mediocre, right? And I think this is intentional. It's on purpose. And they, so they have no idea how the world really works. And they're going to be introduced into the shadow government. And it's just going to completely destroy their world. Because they're, because they're naive, really. And when we learn that a certain Arlington Stewart, played by Frank Langella, has uh, been resuscitated and uh, saved in a burn unit, he's the one who comes to the door and presents them with the, the box, who drops it off. And he's playing, he arrives, pulls up in this black Lincoln, and he's the man in black. And so Arthur heads off to work, for privately constructing a prosthetic foot for Norma secretly, right? So we don't really know what, this is not exactly what NASA is supposed to be doing, right? But it's almost like, well, NASA is a kind of a front for doing other work. This is kind of like transhumanism, perhaps. Uh, because Norma, we, we learn, is slightly crippled. And in many of the so-called UFO experiences, when the men in black arrive on the scene, it's, described in this way. Now, I'm not advocating aliens uh, or the assorted mythology that's usually attached there too, but I'm just saying that it does match up to that uh, narrative, that storyline. So Norma discovers that another box, uh, uh, there's a box with another box in it, and that's you know the, the box with the, the red button that you push to get your million dollars and kill somebody. Now, Arthur comes to discover that he's been rejected from his acceptance as an astronaut. And this was his longtime personal goal. And a lack of funding for the new house and the new car would have come from him getting the astronaut position that he was counting on. So they're going to start having big time money issues. Norma teaches English at a local Catholic private school. And it, it's significant because they're studying Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit, right, which is a certain, uh, and it, during this scene, a certain miscreant in the class attempts to embarrass Norma by asking her how she got her club foot. Uh, Nor Norma acquiesces, and the reason this is relevant is because if you know the, the existentialist philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre, it's Sartre who preferred that as we mature, it becomes evident that we are simply living our lives as different roles, as masks. We wear a cloak. And this is because we want to escape freedom that we're condemned to. We're condemned to be free, but we're afraid of it, so we flee it and we accept these roles in society, doctor, teacher, mother, whatever. And that this is a actually a means of escaping the freedom that we're condemned to. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying that's the, the Sartre view. Now Norma's club foot is an imperfection because, and she hides it because it's a remind her, reminder of her beautiful appearance is what masks the club foot as a facade. It's not real. And were Norma to embrace her defects, she would actually be free from the stigma that such defects produce in the psyche, so she thinks. And for Sartre, we even hide behind such roles as suburban middle class housewife, as I said because there's a kind of ease in accepting that pre-programmed norm, that set of rules and conditions by which we will then live. Uh, this role, this uh, mother imagery, right? This, the traditional mom, this imagery that's been handed down from middle-class suburban forebearers, Sartre would call this being in itself. And he, he likens it to being an inanimate rock. And those who become free, who face up to the fact that we're condemned to be free, realize 
that radical freedom and become being for itself. That, that would be uh, roughly Sartre's notion of awakening. Becoming free and undetermined. Prior to that, you're determined. You're determined by the role to, of being housewife, doctor, or whatever. And this will be relevant for the initiatory revelation that we will see later. So Norma mentions to another student about hell and Sartre and that hell has, Sartre has a famous quote that hell is other people. And I've heard Jonathan Bowden say this, but actually I said it a long time ago too. And that's that in my view, hell is other Sartre's, right? Because it would be like the reason that Sartre says uh, hell is other people is that well, it's existentialism is ultimately just uh, very individualistic and very sick of uh, you know everything else that's out there, which is odd because Sartre ended up a Maoist, which is completely insane. But you're listening to Esoteric Hollywood, and I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back to discuss Richard Kelly's The Box. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Every Tuesday to Friday... 10 p.m. Pacific on TalkNetwork.com. It is esoteric Hollywood. Tonight we're discussing two Richard Kelly films, Donnie Darko and The Box. And we come to the point in the story, which is about this NASA front secret space program, where where the couple, upper middle class couple, that have learned that they're not going to be uh, the husband's not going to be an astronaut. They're having to deal with the problems that begin arising in their life. And we've been discussing existentialism and Sartre because that plays a big role in the scene where Norma is teaching, uh, teaching this story to her students. Now, Arthur's son says he doesn't believe in Santa when the conversation comes up because Arthur is a scientist and it's also relevant that this is, this is Christmas time right just like in Eyes Wide Shut it's Christmas time and that's when all the craziness goes down and this is relevant because I think we're supposed to understand that scientism itself is another mask and I think Sartre would agree with that rationalism the idea that science can solve everything and explain everything at least Jean-Paul Sartre would say that is another mask of rationalist inductionism, right? And when presented with the mystery of radical freedom, even the scientist timidly avoids this for fearfully concluding that science may not be able to answer everything, right? Science is functioning as a religion. Now, Arthur and Norma are about to encounter something that they could have never imagined, right? And this is going to be the dark shadow government. And it's almost like we get hints that there's almost like there's watchers involved in this, right? Like it's demonic. Absolutely. And so at NASA the next day, there's a press conference on the upcoming Viking Mars probe. And curiously, there's interjected statements about the expected discovery of alien life, ancient alien civilizations. And this is precisely what Arthur C. Clarke and NASA videos at the time were promoting. As if you've seen my analyses about uh, 2001 and other pieces like that, I've included that video where Clarke talks about this. Now, isn't it somewhat obvious that you will find what you're looking for? Right. If, in other words, science is not very neutral uh, if it's completely sold on this idea of aliens, which I've highlighted so many times in so many pieces, especially in the more recent piece I did, uh, the Holy Church of St. Darwin's Space Brotherhood, which I should, I would definitely recommend you check out if you're a bit confused as to what I'm talking about.